This video contains solutions to practice problems from section 6.1 on power series and functions. For these first few examples, we're going to be practicing finding the radius and interval of convergence of a power series. So in this course, we're always going to use the ratio test to get started with this kind of problem. So remember that the ratio test, we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 divided by a n. This is going to help us figure out the starting point for what we're eventually going to figure out is the interval of convergence. So we set this up using our expression here. So a n plus 1 is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 and a n is x to the n divided by n. Since we've got a fraction divided by a fraction, we're going to flip over the bottom fraction and multiply. So that's going to give us x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 multiplied by n divided by x to the n. So we're using the ratio test here because at the very least, the x terms will simplify. The x to the n on the bottom will divide out with the x to the n plus 1, leaving just one factor of x on the top. Now, there's no other simplification we can do, but we know that n is always positive. So all of the n stuff, the absolute value isn't going to do anything to that. So we just have the absolute value of x multiplied by n over n plus 1. And x and n are independent here, right? x is the value that we're plugging into this function, right? We're thinking of this as like an f of x. But n is the index of the series. It starts at 1, goes to 2, goes to 3, and so on. And so we can basically ignore the x here and just focus on what's going to happen as n goes to infinity. And we've seen these kinds of limits a lot so far in our study of sequences and series. And so hopefully we can tell that this fraction is going to go to the number 1. And so this limit is going to be the absolute value of x. So remember that when we're using the ratio test, the result that we get from this limit if that result is less than 1, then this series will converge. And if absolute value of x is greater than 1, then this series will diverge. So what we want to think about is on our number line, which numbers are we talking about? So we're centered at 0. We go down to negative 1. We go down to positive 1. So the numbers in between plus 1 and minus 1, these numbers here, those are the values where the absolute value of x is less than 1. And so our series will converge here. But if we go to the right of 1, that's where absolute value of x will be greater than 1, and so our series will diverge. And if we go to the right of negative 1, sorry, to the left of negative 1, then again our absolute value of x will be greater than 1, and our series will diverge. So the ratio test, though, does not tell us anything about what happens when x, the absolute value of x, the result of your limit, is actually equal to 1 absolute value of x equals 1 at plus or minus 1 here. And so those we have to consider separately. So we have to think to ourselves, what's going to happen when x equals 1? Well, in this case, we're going to do the sum of 1 to the n divided by n, which is just 1 over n. And we know that that's the harmonic series, which diverges, which means positive 1 is not going to be included in our interval of convergence. That's going to be a point where my series is going to diverge. But when x is negative 1, what we get is the series minus 1 to the n divided by n. That's our alternating harmonic series. And we've seen that that series converges, which means that negative 1 is included in my interval of convergence. And so my interval of convergence is from minus 1 to 1, including minus 1, but not including plus 1. So that's the interval of convergence. What's the radius of convergence? Well, that's the distance from the center out to those endpoints. So the radius here is going to be 1. So minus 1 to 1, including minus 1, not including 1. That's my interval. My radius is 1. All right, what about this example? Again, we're going to approach it the same way. We're going to start by using the ratio test. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value of a n plus 1 divided by n, a n. That's going to give us a fraction of, uh, over a fraction. So we're going to flip over the bottom fraction and multiply. So we'll end up with absolute value n plus 1, x to the n plus 1, over 2 to the n plus 1. That's the top fraction. And then the flipped over bottom fraction is 2 to the n on top, and then n, x to the n on the bottom. As before, we're going to get some simplification. So the x to the n plus 1 and the x to the n is going to leave us with an x on top. 2 to the n, 2 to the n plus 1, those will divide out, leaving a 2 on the bottom. So we end up with the limit as n goes to infinity. Again, the absolute value is only going to apply to the x here. All the n stuff and the 2, that's all positive. So the absolute value isn't going to do anything there. So we get x, absolute value, 
multiplied by n plus 1 on top and 2n on the bottom. As n goes to infinity, again, nothing is going to happen to the absolute value of x, and this fraction is going to go to 1 half. So we get absolute value of x multiplied by 1 half, and remember that for this power series to converge, that needs to be less than 1, which means that the absolute value of x needs to be less than 2. So again, thinking about a number line, we can tell that our center of our series is at 0. Absolute value of x equals 2 at plus or minus 2, and so our interval of convergence is between negative 2 and 2, possibly including one or both of those endpoints. We'll have to check the endpoints directly here in just a second. But we're already able to figure out the radius of convergence, which is going to be two. Remember, the radius is how far is it from the center of your series out to those endpoints. In this case, that's two. So radius here, our answer would be radius equals two. What about the interval? Well, again, we know that the interval is going to be from minus two to two. The only question is, will that include the endpoints? So we need to check those directly. So what happens when x equals 2? Well, we get the series sum n times 2 to the n divided by 2 to the n. Those will divide out, so we just get the sum of n, which is, in this case, 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, and so on. That's going to diverge by the divergence test. Those terms do not go to 0, and so that series will diverge. All right, what about our other endpoint? Well, our other endpoint is x equals negative 2, so that's going to be the sum n times minus 2 to the n divided by 2 to the n. That will simplify into n times minus 1 to the n, and that will be the series 0, minus 1, plus 2, minus 3, plus 4, minus 5, plus, and so on, and that will also diverge by the test for divergence. Those terms are not going to 0, so that series can't converge. And so in this case, neither one of our endpoints is included in our interval. And so our interval is just minus 2 to 2, not including either one of those endpoints. And that's our answer to this one. All right, one more of these, and then we'll move on to a different type of problem. Again, same idea. If we weren't already convinced that we should use the ratio test, then the n factorial seals the deal. We definitely want to use the ratio test here. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity, as usual, of the absolute value of a n plus 1 divided by a n. Again, I will flip over the bottom fraction and multiply just to save a step here. So we get 3 to the n plus 1 times x minus 4 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial multiplied by the flipped over bottom fraction, which is n factorial on the top, 3 to the n, x minus 4 to the n on the bottom. We're going to get a whole bunch of simplification here. 3 to the n plus 1 and 3 to the n. Those are divide out, leaving a 3 on the top x minus 4 to the n plus 1 on the top, x minus 4 to the n on the bottom, leaving an x minus 4 on the top. And then as we've seen before in our prior applications of the ratio test, n factorial and n plus 1 factorial will divide out, leaving just an n plus 1 on the bottom. So when all the dust clears, what we end up with is an absolute value of x minus 4, and then we've got 3 times n plus 1, or 3 divided by n plus 1. Now this fraction, 3 divided by n plus 1, that's going to go to 0, and that's going to go to 0 regardless of what the value of x is. Remember, n is going to infinity, but x isn't going anywhere. x is just whatever number we decided to plug into this series. And so what's going to happen here is we're going to get the absolute value of x minus 4 multiplied by 0, and that's going to be 0 regardless of what x is. And 0 is less than 1. And so by our ratio test, this series converges no matter what x is. It didn't end up mattering what the value of x was. We always get zero when we apply the ratio test to the series, which means the interval of convergence here is all real numbers, minus infinity to infinity. That's my interval. And my radius in this case, we say that the radius is infinity because we get the whole number line. Our series is centered at x equals four, but Every value of x is going to work here. Every value of x is going to give us uh, a result from this series. Okay, so one of the applications of power series is the ability to find a power series to represent a whole bunch of different functions. And we're gonna see more of these as we continue on in this chapter. But the first type of uh, these problems that we can see is to substitute into our geometric series, right? We know that this series is going to converge when the thing we plug in is between minus one and one. And so the idea here is that we can plug in x squared. So our formula says that 1 over 1 minus x is the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity 
of x to the n, and so all we're doing here is replacing that x with an x squared. And so this is going to be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of x to the 2n. So that's our formula, but which values of x make that formula work, right? In other words, what's the interval of convergence of this series that we're looking at? Well, what we know from this series is that when we plug in x, x has to be in this interval, which means if we're plugging in x squared, then x squared has to be in the interval from minus 1 to 1. Or in other words, the absolute value of x squared has to be less than 1. Now, x squared is always positive, or not negative at least, so that's the same as just saying x squared is less than 1. And if we think about the graph of y equals x squared, we know that that's a parabola. Looks something like that. And we want to know when is that less than y equals 1. Well, that's going to be from negative 1, because this is the point minus 1 comma 1, up to positive 1, because this is the point 1 comma 1. And so this is the same as saying that x absolute value is less than 1, because x would have to be between minus 1 and 1. So the interval of convergence for this series is minus 1 to 1. So there's our formula, and there's our interval of convergence. All right, what about this one? Similar idea. Again, the idea is we want to try to plug in something to this formula, 1, minus, 1 over 1 minus x squared. In this case, we can do that by plugging in 4x squared. But how do we get this x squared on the top? Well, all we have to do is multiply by x squared. So the way we're going to get x squared divided by 1 minus 4x squared is to take x squared and multiply it by 1 divided by 1 minus, and then the thing that we're substituting in is 4x squared. So our power series is going to look like the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 4x squared raised to the n power. And so when we simplify that, we're going to get 4 to the n, x to the 2n, because x squared to the n is x to the 2n, and then when we multiply by this x squared, that's just going to add 2 to my exponent for x. So that's my power series formula for this function. What's the interval of convergence? Well, again, the thing that we plugged in, which in this case is 4x squared, that has to be an absolute value less than 1. But again, 4x squared is non-negative, so that's just the same as 4x squared less than 1. And again, we're going to use a graphical argument here. 4x squared is also a parabola. And again, the question is, when will the y value be less than 1? This is y equals 1, so I'm interested in when will my y value be less than that? So it's going to be from this number up to this number. That's my interval of convergence. So what are those numbers? Well, this is y equals 4x squared. So if I set those two things equal to each other, what I find is that the two intersection points are plus and minus 1 half. And so what I can tell here is that my interval of convergence is going to be x less than 1 half greater than negative 1 half. And so that's the answer here. So we've got our formula and we've got our interval of convergence. All right, one last example. So a little bit more complicated here because of the thing that we're plugging in, but same basic idea. Now we want the function 1 over x, and the hint here is to write this as 1 over 1 minus 1 minus x. So again, it's 1 minus x that we're substituting in. We're substituting into this formula. So it's the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of whatever we substituted in raised to the n power. So that's our power series formula. And then the only question is, what's our interval of convergence? So again, the interval of convergence is going to be when whenever what we plugged in is less than 1 in absolute value. So how do we solve something like this? Well, when we've got an absolute value on the left-hand side, then and it's less than, that just means that 1 minus x is between minus 1 and 1. So we can subtract 1 from all three parts of this inequality. And then we can multiply everything by a negative 1 to change the sign from negative x to positive x. But whenever we multiply an inequality by a negative, that changes the direction. So if we flip this around, that gives us 0 less than x less than 2. And that's our interval of convergence. So for now, the way that we're going to find power series formulas for functions is to substitute in two power series representations that we already have. We're going to see in the next section that there are other tools that we can use to generate new power series representations for existing functions. So I'll see you then.